This video is on infections of the brain and the meninges. So let's just go over some anatomy. We have our brain, and then the meninges is the protective layer around it. And you can break the meninges into the dura mater, and the dural venous sinuses. And then you have your arachnoid with this subarachnoid space. That's where your blood and your CSF is. CSF. And then lastly, your last layer would be your pia mater. Correct? So today we're going to talk about infections of either your brain or your meninges. And we'll start with your meninges first. You get an infection of your meninges when uh, microorganisms get in contact with your meninges. That makes sense. Microorganisms. Now, how can they get into contact with your meninges? It, very rarely, they can do it through direct contact if you have like an open fracture or sometimes through your nose because you can reach your brain through your nose. So, all right, nasal contact. <clears throat> That's very rare. The more common way to do it is through your blood. So, you get into your bloodstream and then go through your blood into your meninges in your subarachnoid space. So the infection usually involves your arachnoid, your subarachnoid, your pia mater. We sometimes call that leptomeninges. That's just a fancy word to say. It involves this area, and that makes sense because that's where all your blood vessels are. So what are some signs? Classic signs are headache. You're going to have fever because it is an infection. And the biggest giveaway is neck stiffness. Once you have an infection, inflammation of your meninges, you don't want to do anything to move it, so you don't want to turn your neck. Or sometimes a, a good physical exam sign is if you turn the patient's neck, they'll kind of flinch or they'll flex your knees up. Yeah, so those are just some clinical signs from the neck stiffness, so that is a big one. Now what causes all these signs? The bacterial infection itself is usually not the cause of this. Instead, it's our body's immune system, our immune response to it. So we release a ton of cytokines, cause a lot of inflammation. In fact, infections of your meninges, we call it meningitis, inflammation of your meninges. And so we have an immune response, immune response, causing that inflammation, causing that pain, causing <coughs> uh, increased permeability. So you have increased permeability, more protein, more fluids will go in, so fluid, all right, edema, protein, all right, inflammation. So this causes all these signs. Now the fluid and edema usually isn't enough to raise your ICP, but, but in extreme cases it could be. And this is all due to the microorganisms invading your meninges. Now understand I said microorganisms. That includes bacteria, viruses, fungus, parasites, I can, everything basically, everything from your micro block. Yeah, it can get into your bloodstream, go into your meninges. But the main ones are bacteria, viruses, TB, fungus. Okay, well in here, how do we find the organism? Well, we can look in the CSF. So we take some CSF samples, usually from the back, we call it a lumbar puncture. Yeah, so say lumbar puncture, lumbar puncture and we can draw some CSF and take it for a sample. Now your lumbar puncture, there's, a, there's several contraindications. You don't want to do it if there's an active infection over the site. That's just obvious. You don't want to introduce more bacteria. You also don't want to do it if there's signs of incredibly increased ICP, raised ICP. Now normally meningitis doesn't raise your ICP that high, but it could. Or you can also have things like tumors or masses that raise your ICP. In this case, you would want to do a CT just to confirm there's raised ICP, and if there is, then you can't do a lumbar puncture. Yeah, you would just have to treat it empirically. Why do we care so much if there's raised ICP in a lumbar puncture? What, why is it contraindicated? Well, when you poke a hole in the back and you relieve that pressure, then all that pressure kind of comes out through that. But a hole, that just kind of makes sense. And a raised ICP, it can come out so fast that your head just basically collapses and it, and it causes brain herniation. It's kind of like if you blow up a balloon, if I take a balloon and I blow it up very slightly and I poke it with a needle, it kind of just whoosh. But if I blow it up until it can't blow up anymore, as, as big as it can get, as, as much pressure as it can hold, and I poke it with a needle, it'll, it'll, it'll basically explode, wouldn't it? So that's kind of the same principle. If the patient has incredibly raised ICP, you don't want to do a lumbar puncture. So I'll say no LP. Understand, 
But let's say the patient doesn't have incredibly raised SCP, doesn't have an infection, you do a lumbar puncture and you get the sample back. You can culture it and see what organism grows, but that takes a few days and we don't want to just twiddle our thumbs while we're waiting. So we can instead look at the other things in the CSF to try and give us an idea of what's going on. The other things you can find are going to be things like glucose, things like protein. Like I said, you increase your permeability, you just have increased protein. And then you can find inflammatory cells. Now we said these are the big players that cause meningitis. So things like bacteria, fungus, TB, and viruses. And by looking at the glucose, looking at the protein, looking at what type of inflammatory cells are found in the CSF, we can kind of guess, to our best knowledge, what is affecting the meninges. We can say, okay, it's more likely a bacterial infection or a fungal or a TB or a virus, and that kind of guides our treatment. So as for glucose, what are you going to see in bacteria, fungal, and TB? You're going to see decreased glucose. Bacteria, fungal, infections, and TB just love to eat glucose. The more glucose you have, the better. They're just, they just like it that much more. Like Kind of like when you have increased glucose in your urine, you just increase risk of UTI because they just <laughs> enjoy it. It's like a feast for them and they can proliferate more. So all of these are going to eat your glucose and you're going to have decreased glucose. Your viruses, on the other hand, doesn't really need any other substance. Your viruses infect your cells. They take your machinery. They take your substance. So glucose, glucose levels are usually normal in viral infections. Proteins. These are all increased. They all cause inflammation, all cause increased edema, all cause increased protein to flow through. Sometimes viruses usually isn't that severe of an inflammation as opposed to things like bacterial, fungal, TB. So sometimes they might say normal, but just know sometimes it can be normal, sometimes it can be high. The cells, cells that you find are gonna be an incredibly important clue to tell you what's going on. So in bacteria, you're gonna see a lot of neutrophils because neutrophils are your first line leukocyte when it comes to bacteria. They might, they might try and throw you off, give you a fancy name. Instead of saying neutrophils on the question stem or to answer choices, they might say polymorphonuclear leukocyte. What the heck does that mean? Leukocyte meaning it's a white blood cell because neutrophils are white blood cells. Polymorphonuclear because, because the nucleus of your neutrophils is multinucleated. They usually look like this. So we just call that polymorphonuclear leukocytes or a white blood cell that's multinucleated. That's just, this is a way they can confuse you, all right? Now funguses, our main player is going to be our lymphocytes. So is the same with viruses, lymphocytes. TB is, is a bacteria, but it's a very a unique bacteria. Microbacterium is just is just kind of funky. All right, so that's why we kind of listed outside of the bacterial region. And this, because it's so funky, you see both cells, lymphocytes and neutrophils. All right, hope that makes sense. Hope that kind of clears things up. Now, what is the treatment for meningitis? Well, if it's bacterial, we're gonna give antibiotics. Fluids, of course, and things like corticos to kind of reduce that inflammation, reduce that immune response, reduce that swelling. Because if you don't, you can cause long lasting neuro complications. Things like deafness, things like hydrocephalus, either from acutely the raised ICP or you can scar the subarachnoid space and you can't drain the CSF anymore. You can have seizures from the brain damage you can also have that bacteria kind of disseminate into your blood and it can disseminate, it can cause DIC, it can disseminate into your adrenals and cause bleeding there. So hemorrhage into your adrenals, we call that Waterhouse Friedrich syndrome. Your adrenals will basically die, you have adrenal cortical insufficiency, you won't be able to maintain your blood pressure, you just go into shock and fortunately the mortality rate of this is pretty high. So we don't want all that, so we want to give prompt antibiotics, corticos, fluids. Now that's bacteria, how about viruses? Viral causes is usually supportative, supportative care. Sometimes there are viruses that can penetrate more deep and cause seizures. It'll affect your temporal lobe. And if a patient has 
all these signs of headache, fever, neck stiffness, and then they go into a seizure, that's HSV. HSV loves to go and infect the brain, especially the temporal lobe, and cause seizures. So you can get seizures from a complication later on, but you can also get acute seizures during your actual initial bout of meningitis. And if you see seizures in someone with meningitis, it's HSV. And this, once it gets to this point, we don't do support to, supportive care anymore. We actually start adding antivirals like acyclovir. Because we know the organism, we know it's causing a lot of damage. We gotta stop it somehow, acyclovir. Now, fungal treatment is just against the fungus, whatever fungus is causing it. Uh, fungal causes, uh, it usually doesn't pop up unless you're immunocompromised. All right, the most common, the more common cause of meningitis is usually Bacterial. So let's just talk about some bacterial causes. They change depending on how old the patient is. You gotta know that. All right, they change with the patient's age in a neonate, a little baby. They're most often group B strep. Usually the group B strep that colonizes the vaginal canal that I just came out of. So group B strep is a big one. E. coli. And L monocytogenes. It used to be a, a big cause. A big cause in neonates way back when used to be H H flu, H influenza. But thanks to vaccines, we don't we don't see that anymore. But in an unvaccinated child, or they might say immigrant, what do you think they might suffer from? Be H flu. So they might have H flu meningitis. All right unvaccinated they really like to to make unvaccinated patients either from a different country or a traveler okay so that that's their way of saying unvaccinated without actually saying unvaccinated so h flu in kids and teens as we grow older this is usually n meningitis Neisseria meningitis which can spread from your nasal cavity, like we said, there's a, you can go to your brain from your nasal cavity. And this is peculiar because it not only causes all the sim symptoms, we talked about headaches, fever, neck stiffness, but it also causes a petechial rash. You gotta know that cold. As I say petechial rash, you don't have to, they don't have to tell you anything more about what bacteria is causing it. That's a giveaway for N. meningitis. N. meningitis is also the one bug that's really, really implicated in Waterhouse Friedrichs. Okay, so they might say a patient comes in, next stiffness, headache, petechial rash, and then they develop shock sepsis, where they are at risk for, be Waterhouse Friedrich, particularly because it's the bug that's most implicated in it. Okay, so that's how they like to ask those questions. Now, older still, and adults and elderly people, is usually strep pneumo. So that does it for bacteria, viruses. The most common cause is Coxsackie or echo. Fungus, numerous causes, but just know if they said there's a fungal meningitis, they're, they're trying to say the patient's immunocompromised without saying they're immunocompromised. So, fungal infections come up in immunocompromised patients. So those are all your bugs. What do you think I'm gonna ask you to do? I'm gonna ask you to list everything you know about every single one of these bugs. So pause the video, do that as a sort of mental exam, and if you can, list them out just like that, you're in great shape. If you haven't done microbial, kind of mark this video and save it, put it somewhere else, kind of keep it in the back of your mind, and then after you've done microbial, come back and try and go through all these. All right, and not only the characteristics of the bug, but the treatment also. So that is your meningitis. That's your infections of your meninges. Now we can talk about infections of your brain itself. Now, infections of your brain, your brain parenchyma, is called encephalitis. Encephalitis. Symptoms are similar, so you're gonna have your headache, fever, but you're not gonna have neck stiffness because it's not an infection of your meninges. 
you don't have that restriction of neck movement from inflamed meninges, so no neck stiffness. There are way too many bugs to actually get into detail about. So again, it'll be in my microbial block. But the main ones, what's now? What causes what's now? What's the virus? What's the vector? What's now is what's now is flavivirus. Be a mosquito. What particular mosquito? Don't just wear a mosquito. So no the particular virus, flavivirus. No the vector, and no that causes encephalitis. At least just for our neuro block. Other ones, you can have JC virus, which is John Cunningham virus. They named it after the patient that had this. So JC virus is a virus that virtually all of us have, 70 or 90% of us. So why would it show up now? The patient would be immunocompromised. Immunocompromised. And this not only affects your brain, but it actually causes demyelination. Demyelinates your brain. That's no good. Now we don't like using patient's name we want, sometimes a more scientific name, and this is coming from your polyoma virus. Some other ones, toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a parasite that's seen in poo, especially cat feces. Um, unless your cats, unless you have like six cats and they're all outdoor cats, you're, you're probably not at risk of this. If you have one or two indoor cats and they're not actively hunting mice outside or whatever, then you're usually not at risk. But in uh, pregnant women, we kind of tell them don't handle cat feces, et cetera, et cetera, because this can cause infection of not only your brain, but the baby's brain. Okay, so the toxoplasmosis. Tinea solium. This is a tapeworm found in pork, and it's actually incredibly common. Goes into your brain from your intestines and usually lies dormant, not a problem, but sometimes it can cause seizures. In fact, it's one of the most common causes of seizures in the developing world. All right. So in here in, in America, if you have a seizure, it's probably due to hyperactivity of, of your neurons. But in developing world, if you have a seizure, you're thinking of things like pork tapeworm. So this is pork tapeworm. Again, I want you to, once you've done microbiome, or if you've already done microbiome, pause the video. Tell me everything you know about all the things I've listed, okay? If you let infections persist in your brain, you can form an abscess, an abscess. And you're gonna have all these signs, but you're gonna have, but you're gonna be way sicker. You're gonna be very ill. You're gonna have focal deficits because you basically have a focal mass and it can compress and cause damage focally. And it can also raise ICP, so increase ICP. What will you do in these patients? If you said lumbar puncture, you're wrong. I just said you have raised ICP. We don't do lumbar puncture and raised ICP. So we do our CT, MRI, and look for these lesions. So we do CT and MRI, and we'll find these lesions, and we'll know we're dealing with an abscess. All right, so that does it for the infections of the meninges and the brains. Thanks.